Mortality risk goes down dramatically from birth to about 10 to 14 years old. That's the lowest all-cause mortality is when you're basically just a teenager. And then it pretty closely linearly increases for every year that we're alive after that. So if we know all of these biomarkers of as many organ systems as possible, instead of seeing that linear increase for mortality risk, can we flatten it? If we can flatten it, for how long, right? 50 years, 20 years? Welcome to the Seam Lund Podcast. My name is Seam Lund, and today our guest is Dr. Michael Lustgarden. Michael has a PhD in exercise physiology and is one of the world's leading experts in self-quantification and biological aging. Michael has an amazing YouTube channel called Conquer Aging or Die Trying, where he shares the latest research on longevity and also shows his personal experimentations. Michael, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Seam. Yeah, I'm uh, happy to have you back on the show. It's your third time. And uh, I always think of, you know, what are the guests I bring to the show? It's always people I'm like most interested in talking at that moment. So <laughs> you are you have a lot of this, like I think you're the one, one of the like really original, let's say not bio biohackers, but more of like the guy who tracks all the biomarkers. Like you've been doing this for, you know, over 10 years of tracking all your food and tracking all your biomarkers several times a year. So you you have, at least for yourself, you have pretty much a ton of data about what kind of supplements, what kind of foods and exercise affect your biomarkers and how it correlates with your speed of aging and and uh, longevity overall. So yeah, I'm happy to um, you know pick your brain about in this episode we'll be focusing mostly on like nutrition and the diet and how it like affects these uh, biomarkers that are linked to mortality or uh, longevity. Yeah, cool. I I'm not the only one, right? So you've recently met Joe Cohen too. So he's uh, been deep in the game for a long time too. And probably even more in some ways with, uh, you know, the blood testing, right? So he's got his panelists, to, not to give South Dakota a shout out, but, <laughs> or to give them a shout out, but uh, their, their panel is ex extensive and exhaustive. And I wouldn't say that if it wasn't true, right? So mm. yeah. Uh, and I see you jumping, you know, doing, you know, in that in that group too. So, uh, you know, we're a small but evolving um, group of people who are, you know, trying to optimize our way to maximum health and longevity through objective biomarker tracking. Mm. Yeah. So um, maybe we can start with um, what is your yeah like philosophy or how do you look at it, like uh, tracking biomarkers and how would you like, let's say, because like in the world of nutrition, there's so much noise and so much like conflicting information like one week you hear on the headlines that you know eggs are great for you and the other next week it says even one egg is as bad as smoking a pack of cigarettes <laughs> so you know there's a lot of people obviously being very confused about that so what's your like i don't know philosophy or uh, view on this yeah so it isn't just that side of it the other side of it too is based on animal studies and you know randomized controlled trials and people in other people Many people in the, you know, pro longevity or wanting to slow aging space will say, oh, you know, I'm going to take X, Y, or Z supplement, or I'm going to do this to my diet because of studies in other people and studies in animal models of, of longevity, but never actually testing themselves to see if that intervention or interventions is a negative, neutral, or actually a positive, right? So for the longest time, as you mentioned, you know, I've been looking at a, just even the standards, looking at biomarkers of kidney function, liver function, immune cells, inflammation, metabolic health, the full spectrum, blood pressure, lung function, um, based on the premise that if I track these things for a very long time, not only will I discover the diet, exercise, supplement, and in some cases, uh, or in some cases, supplement and sleep approach that can minimize mortality risk and potentially maximize my longevity, um, uh, you know, but if I do end up with a disease, I should be able to catch it earlier rather than I've got some pathology that's been happening for 20 years. And it's like, where did this come from? Right. So, mm. and then not just that, knowing how my body reacts to certain foods or certain supplements that may guide uh, whatever therapies, if some adverse health condition does come up. So the crux of my uh, approach besides, you know, testing, tracking, intervention, and repeat, which I call the F around find out approach. <laughs> <laughs> is uh is you know so mortality risk goes down dramatically from birth to about 10 to 14 years old that's the lowest all-cause mortality is when you're basically just a teenager 
And then it pretty closely linearly increases for every year that we're alive after that. Right. So if we know, you know, all of these biomarkers of as many organ systems as possible, instead of seeing that linear increase for mortality risk, can we flatten it? And if we can flatten it for how long, right? 50 years, 20 years. Um, so that's the crux of my, uh, my approach. Mm. Yeah. Like age chronological age is the biggest risk factor for virtually yeah, like all diseases and you know deaths as well so and when you are you know a teenager or even in your early 20s then your a lot of the biomarkers are pretty much optimal or as optimal as they'll ever be at that time frame and you know it, at least in for me as well it makes sense that you know if you maintain those same biomarkers into your 40s and 50s and 60s and even beyond that then uh, yeah like you are effectively uh quote unquote slowing down aging or at least you're minimizing the risk of um a lot of the chronic uh, diseases that you know kill people uh, prematurely 100 percent. so also along those lines is i don't presume that this will stop aging but mm. so like you said when you're in your 20s you should expect to have all these biomarkers of multiple organ systems as you know as close to optimal as possible right so but aging's going to happen right just entropy you know all we can do at best is to slow it right it's the live long enough to live forever approach so you know there may be processes that you wouldn't catch right away that we're not measuring right and with that in mind let's say, you know, you hit your early thirties, you start to see some changes that weren't going on in your early, early twenties. Right. So then the challenge, and this is one of the reasons why I track as many variables as I can is, all right, I, I'm starting to see these changes just that out of nowhere. What can I tweak in my approach to bring them back, back to youthful and not just improve those biomarkers, but the net sum. And, you know, I, I, I liken this to the equalizers on a stereo, you know, it's like, uh, you know, you move one thing for a certain sound and then you move another thing. It, it, it's not as simple as do one intervention, fix one biomarker, nothing else changes. It's it's a constant tweaking of, yeah. I need to get as many of these things back to where they, they should be. And it's not a perfect system. It's a constant trial and error process, right? And we're fighting against it, you know, through various means, exercise, supplements, you know, tweaking the diet. So mm. yeah, it's like, yeah, if you do one thing, like you go on a specific diet, you might see one biomarker improving, like your blood sugar improves, but your you know lipids might get worse or your visceral fat gets worse or whatever it is. So yeah, like you have to pretty much look at all the main, most important biomarkers and uh, not look at it in isolation, so to say. Because yeah, you know you might not die to you know let's say diabetes. But you might still get heart disease or you might still get neurodegeneration, whatever it is. So like, you know, there's you know, at least there's, you know, the World Health Organization lists the top 10 causes of death worldwide. But, you know, there could be like many additional ones as, and, they, and they all kind of uh, contribute to each other in some shape or form. Yeah. So I think a lot of the field is focused on, and especially if you listen to, you know, I wouldn't name, won't name, name, name names, but you know, muscle is the organ of longevity, that crowd, which I don't dispute that, right? But when we talk about longevity, it's an increase in average lifespan. But nonetheless, if you're going to, you know, you're regularly exercising and, you know, you're going to maximize muscle mass, maximize muscle, muscle function, you'd predict that your metabolic health, insulin sensitivity will be low, which is great, which is fantastic. But as you mentioned, are, you know, are your lipids going to put you at lower risk of heart disease, right? Um, you know, and what does kidney function show? What does liver, what are liver health show, right? The, the idea that being lean and fit is the elixir for all organ systems. I, I don't buy that. And I I've seen cases where, you know, people will focus on one thing and then they'll have other systems that are just completely out of whack, like normal glucose, normal lipids and immune cells, like total white blood cells that are like 11, just outrageously high, you know? So we can have selective impairments in certain organ systems and not even know it for decades. Um, or, or there's the other crowd where, you know, um, for kidney function, for example, they'll say, oh, my kidney function is fine. Yeah, based on a normal range, but is it youthful, right? Is it, mm. is it what you'd expect to find in someone in a 20-year-old and your cr chronological age is 50 or older, right? So most people, it's not even on their radar, uh, unfortunately. Underrated, right? Kidney yeah. and liver and all these other things are completely underrated. Yeah, exactly. And like, like you said, you want to pretty much aim for a lower 
biological age with your biomarkers than your chronological age is so like yeah like what's normal you don't want to be like what's normal for your age <laughs> you want to be better than that you want to be quote unquote uh with a younger biological age for that biomarker so like you know you want to have the lipids and the immune cells of a 20 year old uh, rather than a 60 year old <laughs> Yeah, but note that even even like using uh, Levine's Fino age, which is pretty much uh, amongst the best for blood ba blood based biological age calculators, in terms of its correlation with chronological age and all cause mortality risk, it's got blind spots, right? It doesn't include blood pressure, doesn't include lung function, and these are two variables that are that the you know systolic blood pressure increases during aging and uh, FVV one as a measure of lung uh, expiratory strength. That declines during aging. So those are two major organ systems, right? That are completely ignored by that tool, right? And right. then Dunedin pace, which is the epigenetic pace of aging, doesn't necessarily correlate with my Levine test, which covers, you know, albumin and inflammation, glucose, many organ systems. Those data are somewhat disparate in my data. So there may be molecular mechanisms in terms of biological aging that are not captured if we're only looking at one metric of quote unquote biological age. So I think the most reasonable choice is to look at many different measures, you know, the molecular markers of biological age, metabolite markers that can be related to biological age, like whole metabolite profiling, um, and then some of the bigger picture, like cells, white blood cells, red blood cells, uh, proteins, albumin, you know, so looking at it from the molecular epigenetic to, you know, uh, up every level uh, as we can get, right? With the highest level being physiological function, right? So, mm. Yeah, optimizing it every step above that way. <laughs> yeah, um, obviously you could go crazy with all the markers as well. Like there's literally hundreds of them that you could track. What do you think of like the you know, like tier one and tier two or three kind of uh, markers? Yeah. So the lowest hanging fruit is eat real food and exercise. Right. That's without any tracking. Uh, and then above that, leanness and making sure you avoid functional decline. Um, so those two are probably going to link with metabolic health and a whole bunch of other stuff, assuming you're eating real food and exercise, right? But then, so then taking it the step further, the lowest hanging fruit in terms of testing would probably just be a, uh, a standard chemistry panel and complete, uh, metabolic count, you know, or, or sorry, standard, it, it, yeah, CBC, complete blood chemistry. So those two tests, it's a $35 test USD. It covers all of the basics, you know, kidney function, liver function, red and white blood cells and their differentials. That gives you a lot of information from multiple organ systems um, at, at a relatively low cost. Um, and then taking that a step further, blood pressure and lung function, you know, FEV1, just a simple spirometer, a hundred or so dollars USD. You don't need anything fancy. And, you know, blood pressure cuff, that doesn't have to be anything fancy. But then taking it towards the uh, molecular and, and uh, metabolite levels, you know, the epigenetics would be as molecular as you get, at least, the, you know, Horvath and Dunedin Pace Horvath being how old are you, but it's not the best for all-cause mortality risk. And Dunedin Pace, you know, with uh, it's not the best for how old are you, but it's amongst the best for all-cause mortality risk and potentially the best for the speed, epigenetic speed of aging. In terms of metabolites, looking at, you know, somewhat obscure metabolite classes like cholesterol esters, which have been recently linked with a quote-unquote healthy lifestyle, i.e. not smoking, uh, lean BMI, healthy diet. And I have a video on, on my channel where I recently covered uh, that analysis. So cholesterol esters being cholesterol bound to certain fatty acids. But then other things like kynurenine divided by tryptophan, which are an integrated measure of in pro and anti-inflammatory markers. So th there are a lot of a lot of layers, you know, that that one can go after on that on that path. Sure. This episode is brought to you by Bond Charge, my favorite company for blue blocking glasses, red light therapy devices, and red light light bulbs. These items are essential for keeping your sleep wake on the cycles aligned in a world that tries to mess them up. Instead of looking at your phone before bed and letting the blue light disrupt your melatonin production, why not wear blue blockers instead that prevent that from happening? Instead of having your bedroom lit up with bright lights, use the more sleep friendly alternative by opting for flicker free red light light bulbs that don't disrupt your sleep. Bond Charge also has amazing infrared sauna blankets that can give you the same health benefits as the traditional sauna. You also get the unique benefits of infrared light that improves joint and skin health. Head over to bondcharge.com forward slash seamlund and use the code SEAM, S-I-I-M, for a 15% discount. But uh, we can maybe now transition to talking about the diet. Um, obviously, diet 
has a huge impact on our health and uh, biomarkers as well. So what do you, based on like, first we can maybe start with like, based on the epidemiology and clinical studies, what's like generally associated with uh, lower speed of aging and uh, longer, let's say, uh, youth as well as like just reduced mortality. And then we can transition to like, what's your, your data? Like, what have you found in, individually? Yeah, so the in terms of the epidemiological stuff, I haven't looked too much because there just isn't that much data for the epigenetic pace of aging. There's maybe two studies in very small sample sizes, but epidemiologically, you know, it's what we would all expect. And, right. you know, the carnivore crowd is going to uh, hate my guts for saying it. And I'm not opposed to any diet can potentially be good for biomarkers. It's just show me the data. So I'm not trying to, you know, what the published data shows up to now is eat lots of fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, you know, uh, less red meat, uh, m more fish. I mean, this, these are the standards based on the large epidemiological. Yeah, Mediterranean style that. But even Mediterranean is somewhat of a, it's a romanticized diet. Like there are RCTs that uh, intended on giving one group an, uh, a Mediterranean diet and the other ate, um, you know, just whatever. And it was like a one-year RCT that I had in mind. And after one year of being on the quote-unquote Mediterranean diet, um, fiber intake about, across both groups wasn't different, right? And they were looking for gut microbiome changes. So they had to evaluate, you know, the whole cohort as a, you know, were there changes in the microbiome based on people who adhered to the Mediterranean diet versus lower adherence. So long story short there is even what's on a quote-unquote Mediterranean diet is somewhat romanticized part of it's part of it's 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 uh the romanticism that comes with that is that people may be just eating less junk less ultra processed food and that may be some of the explanation for some of the health uh promoting um uh effects that they claim because it's not it's not like a 70 fiber per gram you know per day diet that's what, when i think of the mediterranean diet you're eating real food and an abundance of fruits and vegetables your fiber intake should be sky high but there's no data that any mediterranean diet has gotten above like 40 grams per day so mm, gotcha yeah yeah the at least like in the rcts most of the rcts do find that it uh, improves uh, like the risk factors and also linked to lower heart disease and uh, neurogeneration and those kind of things but it, so I, I don't dispute that a mediterranean diet versus someone's standard american diet which is just chips and soda and all this other garbage is going to be better but how much of the Mediterranean diet is is related to just eating less ultra processed food? That that's the only thing I, you know, even even the idea of, uh, and I guess you know, uh, well anyway, it is what it is. The, the idea that olive oil is this elixir of health, I think that's flawed data too, and that's a big part in quotes of the Mediterranean diet. What if an, and I may have mentioned this before, but what if an equivalent amount of olives, the whole food? was replacing that olive oil. I'd expect that that the biggest effect should be there. Like imagine imagine if I said, I'm going to give you this strawberry sugar and it's going to be great for your health ra relative to just pure glucose. Mm. It, or or I, could I could phrase it as differently. I, I, I'd say, I'm going to give you this strawberry sugar and it's not going to raise your insulin, right? So, so you'd say, oh, it's great, you know, but it's fructose, right? Fructose goes straight to the liver. It shouldn't, it shouldn't increase insulin, right? But if I gave you strawberries, which now have the full complement of all the nutrition, the insulin spike you'd get, if at all, probably far less. Anyway, it's I, I, when it comes to olive oil and the Mediterranean diet, I, I see it in the same way. It's like uh, clever marketing and you know the real control is olives. Give me 200 calories of olives versus 200 calories of olive oil, which is going to come out on top. <laughs> right. You Have you looked at your own data from there, comparing the two? How, how do you mean? Or, I mean, have you done the test in yourself of eating 200 calories of olives versus olive oil? I haven't, only because, uh, you know, 200 calories of pure, of pure oil, I, I don't, I'm not trying to ruin my physiology, you know, for the sake of science, right? So, <laughs> um, but it seems like it'd be an obvious, and then it's like, are you measuring all the things, you know, if you only look at in isolation, a few biomarkers that olive oil could be better than whole olives. But would the full panel be better? I mean, I find it hard to believe that a food processing product would be better than the whole food. If that were the case, we wouldn't eat anything. We'd just be eating soy land, right? So, hmm. so we talked about uh, the uh, epidemiological studies with the 
disease and the longevity. So what is your own personal data say? Right. So I should say that my current diet has evolved out of following the biomarkers. In 2015, I started off raw vegan. That wasn't uh, good for triglycerides and HDL, which went in the wrong directions. My HDL had, had been at low as low at that time as 28. My tri triglycerides were weren't terribly high, went from like 50 to 90. So then once I added fish back in, those uh, got a little bit better, but still uh, not great, especially for HDL. And so the long story short is, um, in terms of macros, I'm at about 40-ish percent fat, which includes um, about 9% or nine coming from fiber. So uh, fiber can be fermented into short-chain fatty acids by the gut microbiome, which you can add to total fat. So my diet's about 40 to 45% fat, 38-ish um, or so from carbs, net carbs, and then uh, around 18 or 19% from total protein. So, but I didn't settle on those data arbitrarily. It's just, you know, it's through that process of like 50 blood tests over the past uh, nine years or so where I've, I've had, you know, fat intakes that are 30 to 40 grams higher than now and looking at the biomarkers, all right, the, the net effect isn't positive. Protein intakes that are 40 to 50 grams higher than now, it wasn't great for my biomarkers either. So, but then on the other side, I've had protein intakes as low as 70 grams per day. So it's a matter of, you know, finding the bottom of the U-shape where, um, you know, the amount of protein, carbs, fat, fiber, even fiber has been as high as 120 grams per day, whereas now it's about 85 to 90. So for me, it was, it's was it been about finding the U-shape of the curve to, uh, you know, optimize as many biomarkers as possible. So that, that those that's the gross macros. Mm. In terms of what foods are in there, it's fish every day. I eat uh, sardines. Um, I'm generally not lazy when it comes to food prep, but uh, Food prep on its own is probably an hour, an hour and a half a day. And I'm not trying to wait 40 minutes for salmon to cook every day and clean clean the oven. I just don't want to do that. So sardines every day, um, you know, nuts, almonds, walnuts, peanuts are in there every day. Um, lots of vegetables, um, uh, lots, lots of fruit too. I mean, it's probably 20 to 30 servings of fruit and vegetable per day. Um, but but then even then, I'm doing little experiments to try to improve some of the weak spots in my data. Like my Horvath epigenetic age is not great. My Dunedin paste needs some work too. And homocysteine also needs some work. So I've got some issues with methylation that, uh, that I'm trying to increase methyl donors first by diet before I go to other, uh, you know, other means. Mm, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, one question about the finding the U shape, um, is that, you know, you, I would presume that your health was still uh, great with uh, you know going from like changing your carbohydrate intake by 30 grams or changing your fat intake by 30 grams because the diet was probably like very similar and you just adjusted some of the macros to find the sweet spot so I would just Im imagine that you were already like in excellent uh, health compared to like the traditional regular person you were just uh, optimizing it to the like yeah last last percentages <laughs> Yeah, no, that's definitely true. You know, um, but it, it becomes a question of what if I didn't, what if I was making all these dietary changes and didn't measure at all, right? And I don't have a crystal ball and I, I don't have a, you know, ideally we could, we could, um, we could, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, we could sim, we could simulate, you know, all right, this is my diet. This, this is my uh, genetic code. This is my microbiome there, you know, microbiome genetics. Um, we put in all those factors and what, you know, if I eat this diet for X amount of years, based on the current published data for the genetics of disease and everything else, uh, w when would I get disease, right? Ideally we'd be able to sim, right? We'd sim all this stuff out, but so mm. I'm doing it in the short, in the short case where, you know, just using it as an, as an example, high fat, higher fat diet in my case. And again, this is whole food. It's not seed oil. Seed oils have almost never been a part of the approach for the past, you know, since 2015, um, Glucose was like uh, in the 90s, glucose increases during aging for like 15 or 18 tests in a row when I was higher fat, like, uh, mm. you know, 120 grams per day versus now where it's closer to around 80 to 90. Once I, once I saw that data in my correlations, I cut the fat back down to around 80 to 85. Problem solved. Glucose has never been, you know, that high. So, or as high as it was. Uh, so, it goes to that point, like, you know, you were, you were saying I was in probably good health, but if I continued on that trend, for whatever reason, in my case, higher, you know, most people here, higher fat was bad for your glucose. They're like, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. But if mm. someone's eating junk and they cut their, 
you know, they go higher fat. Well, maybe they cut the junk out and now their glucose improved. But anyway, so what I'm trying to say is that, you know, I would need to sim it where, yeah. you know, with that higher fat diet for me and glucose perpetually in the 90s, would it have made my insulin sensitivity worse 30 years from now versus getting it back into the 80 to 90 ish range where glucose has not been in the 90s since then? How would that look physiologically 30 years from now? I don't have the answer, right? But all I can do is place the bets based on the, you know, all cause mortality data. Mm. Yeah, it's like you, we need like AI to do the simulation and like this lifelong simulation. But even then, uh, the AI is only as good as the data that it gets. So if we if we were to have a perfect data about, yeah, like these are the lowest risks of mortality, et cetera, and these are the genetic things we know affect this process, then the AI would work. But, you know, we necessarily... It's hard to yell at because the, we don't have perfect data about what's the actual complete lowest risk of mortality for whatever biomarker or for whatever diet or anything else or for whatever genetics. It's it's very complex, is what I'm saying. No doubt. And probably in the beginning, the AI wouldn't be great, but mm. that constant iteration of, okay, every you know seven tests a year or however many tests that I'm doing uh, in a few years you know, it's constantly being reiterated with the AI, right? And, you know, it, it should get better with its predictions over time. And now, granted, maybe 50 years of predictions using what, whatever that AI is giving me, maybe that's not the best. And then people can, if I do die, uh, then people can pick up that torch and mm -hmm. they are, right, this is what he did. We need to refine it and we can improve our, mo our models, right? So eventually someone's going to have it figured out. <laughs> yeah, it's going to take a few uh, guinea pigs. <laughs> <laughs> literally right how do you know like okay this is the food that actually like moves the needle on this marker or something how do you control for those things because you know that you could also like sleep worse or you could exercise differently or take a different supplement or whatever yeah so i track all that um i, I track sleep i track um you know fitness markers including the average daily heart rate and there is some evidence to that where you know if you're if you're more active, you're going to have a higher average daily heart rate chronically. And then I look at the average daily heart rate in conjunction with a blood test. So in other words, if I have a 50 day period in between tests, test one, test two, and I know the average daily heart rate in between that 50 days, that 50 day average corresponds to the latter blood test. So with enough blood tests or even, you know, blood pressure or lung function, whatever variable that I'm looking at, because I'm lining up that average measure of activity with a biomarker, I can look at correlations and see, all right, is it too much activity during this period that may have contributed to some adverse bio biomarker profile? Or if that's not the case, what other variables are significantly correlated with the biomarkers? Now, even there, there's going to be noise, especially when, when one doesn't have a lot of their own biomarker data. But I mean, with a constant iteration over and over of, okay, 20 tests in, I've tried, you know, it, it's constantly trying the top correlations. And after many tests, you start to get towards what's the truth. Now, also, there's a lot of standardization that goes into, you know, before every test. So, uh, for example, you know, I'll do my last workout on a Friday before a Monday test. So I've got at least two days of, you know, somewhat rest and recovery. Uh, on the morning of the test, 20 ounces of water, two to two and a half hours before every test. So I'm now I'm hydrated. Hydration is not going to be, you know, uh, a, a, or lack of hydration is not going to be a negative influence on the biomarkers. So uh, standardizing, and then even the diet on the day before. Now, granted, I'm tracking everything, you know, every day, but the diet on the day before, I don't want that to be so much variability that maybe that imparts variability on the biomarkers. So I pretty close to standardize my intake for, for that, you know, day before for every test going back. So now it's not the day before diet that impacted the biomarkers. It's, you know, what is the average intake for that period or even average activity level, average sleep. I have all of that data where I can look at it in conjunction with the biomarkers. Mm, gotcha. I've even uh, started to look at things like wake events during the night, which, which uh, you know, it provides and looking mm. at correlations in my data to see if there's anything that I can do to minimize that potentially improving, you know, sleep duration and sleep quality. Gotcha. Your uh, protein intake, you mentioned, was like, how much was it? Like 19% or something like that? Yep. It's uh, about 100 grams per day. 
um, 1.5 something grams per kilogram, which is close to that uh, mm. Stu mm. Phillips meta analysis of uh, maximizing muscle mass as a result of regular strength training. But I'm thinking about going higher again, and uh, you know, uh, but slow, slow increments because I don't want to mess up a whole bunch of other biomarkers to improve one or or two. Right. What what have you seen from your data? Like, okay, how does protein affect your biomarkers? Like, what has led you to the conclusion that this 19 spot is right now good? And what happens if you take it too high? Yeah. So the 100 grams per day, in my case, around 100 grams per day, um, just using Levine's phenowage as an example, it's a part of that approach. And on my last test, um, it was 19 and a half years younger than my chronological. And remember, that's the integration of multiple organ systems. And that's my best ever data over 30 something tests, right? So I can't say that's causative, but it's a part of the approach that helps me keep that mostly bio, youthful biomarker profile. Um, when I went higher, uh, just using glucose as an example, that's one of the biomarkers too, that for whatever reason went in the wrong direction. Um, so, uh, I'd have to pull up my data to, to go through the full list, but, uh, and I have that data, but. Um, it was m more biomarkers going in the wrong direction than right on a panel of about 25 biomarkers of multiple organ systems. Okay, gotcha. A lot of well, one of the biggest thing that people say about protein is the kidney function, that too much protein is going to be harmful for the kidneys. Did you see anything like that in your data? I, I didn't. I didn't for that. But actually, there's a third uh, rung of that tier, which is the gut. So mm. what most people probably don't know is that very high protein diets, if your body isn't using it, you know, for protein synthesis or whatever it needs, it's just going to take off the amino group and reformulate it into urea for excretion. So sure, if you have poor kidney function, urea is going to accumulate, uh, but that doesn't necessarily imply, uh, you know, uh, direct correlation between protein intake with reduced kidney function. But where urea gets interesting, besides its own all-cause mortality data showing that above, I think, 17 milligrams per deciliter increased all cause mortality risk. Uh, urea at about 20 milligrams per deciliter can impair intestinal tight junctions, meaning it can degrade the barrier in between intestinal epithelial cells, making it easier for stuff that's in the intestinal lumen to leak into the blood, potentially activating inflammation and, and other, you know, pathways that aren't going to be good for health. So now granted, my bun as a, as, as a marker of protein intake is nowhere near that 17 uh, milligrams per deciliter. It's about half that. So I do have some room to play with in terms of, uh, you know, how much protein can my body actually utilize where it doesn't negatively impact intestinal barrier function. Um, so I look at it from that perspective, uh, you know, too much protein, potentially worse intestinal gut bar barrier function, and that can impact kidney function. There is a gut kidney axis. Um, that most people probably don't know about. Actually, it's in my book from you know the 2016. I put a lot of that data in there. Mm. Right. Yeah, the protein mostly yeah, like, can be harmful for people who have suboptimal kidney function, and uh, there are like some mechanistic reasons that you know theoretically at least like if you even if you are healthy, then maybe excess protein intake for the rest of your life like this higher. This bodybuilder protein intake for the rest of her life probably eventually will have like some sort of negative effect on the kidneys, uh, you know, decades later. But yeah, we don't necessarily know that. But even without the kidneys, you know, there is a trade off there, right? So if you mm -hmm. look at the animal models, protein restriction extends lifespan or yeah. methionine restriction is one example. I think even there's like a leucine or one of the branch chain amino acid restriction too in a recent study extended lifespan, granted in cage fed sedentary mice right so um but then the other side of that coin like you mentioned you know these bodybuilder one one to three gram per pound of body weight not grams per kilogram you know just and there's no published data uh you know that that shows you know these very high levels are, are maximizing muscle mass but i look at it from the other side of it is how can we titrate what is optimal for protein intake and if your blood urea nitrogen is trending high probably it's too much um, but then even, even then it's like, all right, how much, how much bun should I carry where it's not going to be negative for my, you know, systemic physiology while at the same time optimizing muscle mass, you know, with protein. Mm. Intake. Yeah. And blood sugar as well can, at least based on your data, it increased, right? If you had too much protein. It, it was core. Yeah. Protein intake was is significantly correlated with higher glucose in my data. Yeah. So, um, 
and to and high fat too so gotcha and uh the protein when we're talking about protein so you say like you eat fish every day uh what's the uh, rationale for that in your let's say exp uh, experience uh, omega-3s uh you mm -hmm. know epa and dha decline during aging in blood plasma levels that's associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk is that because older people are eating less fatty fish i don't know is that because there's increased inflammation and inflammation inflammation leads to degradation of epa and dha so there's left less of that now systemically probably um so i'm trying to look at it from both angles where i want to give my my physiology and biochemistry enough of it dietarily but then also i'm tracking their levels in blood so if there is any you know uh degradation i can i can look at what's correlated with that degradation and try to minimize that too mm. yeah and uh obviously many people will just ask as well like what's the thing with the meat <laughs> and uh your biomarkers as well or just you know what do you think about meat and the longevity side because we already mentioned some of the methionine aspect as well so beef has has been a part of my diet and actually it's net correl correlative score with about those 25 biomarkers is positive it's got if off the top of my head it's like a plus two or a plus four meaning two to four biomarkers going in the right direction relative to how many are going in the wrong but sardines have like a plus eight score uh, so, wow. so that's one way. So for me, it's sardines, sardines seem to be better. And even eggs, eggs are, uh, either neutral or plus one, some very small, uh, positive, uh, correlative effect. And actually I've added eggs back in for my next test. Um, and that's along the Dunedin pay story, but we can get into that, you know, a bit later, but, but, uh, you know, so, so then, you know, people, people have asked like, okay, why don't you add uh, beef in, in addition to the sardines or add eggs in, in addition. And there's only so many calories that go around. Like, you know, mm -hmm. my, my average calorie intake right now is around, you know, 20, 80 per day. And uh, even to add things in, I've got to take stuff out that I like, or it, it's getting very difficult to find the calories to, to add this stuff in. I like mm -hmm. beef, I'm not anti-beef, I'm not anti-meat by any means. Uh, you know, but it's just a matter of, you know, uh, satiety. I like sardines too. I look forward to it every day. Um, the biomarkers may be better with fish in my diet relative to beef. Uh, and I just don't have calories to add it in anywhere else. Yeah. It's like, there's only, only, only so many superfoods you can add before they actually start to have, yeah, like a negative effect because of the excess calorie, uh, component. So you have to pick <laughs> your, pick your like, uh, battles, if that makes sense. Yeah, hundred percent. And interestingly, the whey, whey protein has been in my approach too. And as I mentioned, one of my weak spots is homocysteine. Now, one of the things that's significantly correlated with lower homocysteine in my data, which is currently age expected, which those words are like stabbing me in the back to hear anything age expected, mm -hmm. uh, higher protein. In my case, when my protein intakes have been closer to 140 grams per day, homocysteine was like seven micromolar, whereas now it's closer to 10, 10 and a half, 11 micromolar. Mm. But then that's only one biomarker. The majority of biomarkers on higher protein, not good. So um, a part of that story is whey. Um, for whatever reason, higher whey intakes, in my case, are significantly correlated with lower homocysteine. But it goes back to, like you were saying, there's only so much room. And if I was going to include whey, now that's 80 calories per day, 20 grams more protein. Where am I going to get that from? And I can hear people saying, take this out, take that out. Don't eat any vegetables. Oh, okay, fine. But that's not, you know, I'm not trying to what ruin about, this. What about more exercise? Like you can do 80, 80 calories more walking or cardio. Yeah. I wish, I wish I could say that every minute of my, uh, activity was geared specifically towards exercise and very little wasted on like, uh, emotional stress, work stress, you know, non-function improving activity for example if i go for a you know a walk sure i'm going to get some baseline improvements but for that 20 minutes i could be doing hit but i can't do hit because i need to take those 20 minutes on a recovery day to you know improve recovery from the 90 minute workout the day before so i've got my exercise dose uh, my prescription there pretty close to optimal too just as an example i know i know your uh heart rate variability resting heart, heart rate combination is uh something like 100 over 40, right? 100 for heart rate variability average, right? Somewhere mm -hmm. in that ballpark. Two days yeah, my ago. HRV yeah. is, yeah, like over 100 and resting heart rate is like 38 or maybe 40 at most. 
two days ago, my heart rate variability was 82, resting heart rate 39. Mm. And I'm 20, I, I don't know, 25, 24 years chronologically older. So, <laughs> but that's because I'm playing with the dose of exercise and how much I'm doing in the recovery days. I'm using like a heart rate variability, resting heart rate guided training, you know, to guide me when and how often in the duration intensity. So, so, uh, when it comes to adding more exercise in my case, on top of what I'm already doing, it doesn't make my data worse, unfortunately for me. And mm. that's, it, I say, unfortunately for me, because mentally I've got like the Conor McGregor level delusion of, I think I, I've, I, I'm gorilla. I can just train for hours like I used to, but my data just, uh, you know, mm. my data just gets wrecked if I do that. So I can't push right, right now. I can't. If I didn't have all the other uh, non-fitness improving time spent away from exercise, if I didn't have that, I could spend more time doing it without impairing my data and potentially improving my metrics where I'd be able to add that. But uh, if unless I leave academia at some point in the next year, year and a half, that's going to be a challenge. Right. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. Um, but uh, yeah, like you eat meat sometimes or uh, what about plant-based proteins as well? Like do you eat any beans or legumes? And what do you think about that? Yeah, so uh, chickpeas are a regular part of the diet now. I I added them for a couple tests. I took them out for many tests and then I added them back in and they're a part of that 19 and a half year reduction for Levine's test. And mm -hmm. they may actually be in, uh, improving my uh, creatinine marker, you know, uh, kidney function, EGFR. I've seen my two best EGFRs using creatinine, which I know it's not, not the best measure, but even cystatin C is 0.71, which is, I mean, what you'd expect to find in someone in, in their 20s and 30s. So chickpeas are now a regular part of the diet, but in order to get them in, I had to take out barley and oats, which I like. Uh, so, um, but yeah, chickpeas are a reg regular part of the diet. I, I can't go too crazy with beans. I have a lot of IgG related eleva ele elevated uh, antibodies for many of the other beans, but chickpeas, no bloating, no gas. Um, mm. Yeah. 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 At least like in, in the epidemiological studies, the, when you see that some of, sometimes like the higher protein intake is linked to mortality and sometimes it isn't, but uh, what they consistently do find is that the plant-based protein intake is consistently lower mortality risk. Whereas with animal protein, it's some, like sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. <laughs> so yeah, like but the, with the plant-based proteins, it's generally obviously there's the risk of the health user bias with uh, the plant-based proteins that if you're eating beans for your protein, then you probably are more like health conscious <laughs> as well. But you know, I, I I think a lot of the biomarkers, you know, you have to kind of experiment and see, okay, what's the how much meat is going to affect my biomarkers. And uh, if you replace it with fish or beans or something like that, how does it improve or decrease uh, the, the results? I, I agree 100%. And along those lines, when I was eating not, not just sardines every day, but uh, beef and eggs were together and, and actually full fat dairy, which I've, I've taken out all dairy over the past few tests and the biomarkers have, have mostly improved. Um, at my most for animal protein intake, the biomarkers were not at their best. Now, in terms of a healthy user bias there, I was also 10 pounds heavier, probably 10 pounds more fat relative to uh, lean mass. Mm. Uh, and I say probably because I don't have DEXA going back five years. It's only two years of data. But mm. so it could be that at my highest animal protein intakes, that extra 10 pounds of fat, maybe that was driving the worst biomarkers. Whereas now, in addition to being leaner, and, and reducing the animal protein intake, is it the less animal protein or is it the leaner? I don't know. Mm. Yeah, it's also the the calorie intake because yep. at least I think in some of the studies where like, you know, or, you know, people eating more fiber, they have lower BMIs almost in a linear fashion. Like the people who eat more, the most fiber have the lowest BMIs and people who eat the least fiber have the higher BMI, at least in uh, cohort studies. So it's, you know, if you're eating more plants, then you're getting less calories from there. Whereas if you are, you know, adding eggs and full fat dairy and uh, meat in there, then, you know, those foods have, you know, twice or three times more calories than uh, vegetables in uh, most cases. Yeah. hundred percent agree there too. Uh, and I've got a couple things on that. So the first is that that doesn't presume that people who are eating almost no fiber can't be lean. And if that's what works best for them, then I'd say go for it because finding the diet that helps you be at your leanest is probably a big part of this approach. But yeah. if you're if that's the only thing you're looking at is leanness as your outcome variable and none of the biomarkers, I'd say to probably expand the approach to just to make sure 
you know, uh, okay, if eating no fruits and vegetables helps me be satiated, helps me be at my leanest and strongest and all these things and functional, if you're not looking at the biomarkers, then maybe you're just setting yourself up for a, you know, a, a, a relatively longer term failure, right? Mm. So then the second, but I'm open to that idea. I'm open to the idea of someone, maybe they don't eat any fruits and vegetables and they can stay lean. So along those lines too, right? In my day job, I just submitted a, a paper yesterday where we fed aged mice uh, standard chow, which is grain-based, you know, oats, corn, and wheat. And then basically the Mike diet, which is paleo-ish. There were no grains. It was fish, nuts, uh, lots of lots of uh, vegetables and fruit. But its soluble fiber intake was three times higher than standard chow. Usually mm. when you hear high fat diet in mice, they're feeding chow as the control diet versus the intervention diet, which is that purified, no real food. And actually it has no fermentable fiber. They give the mice cellulose. Mm. So it's a high fat diet, sure, but it's also soluble fiber free. So mm. we took the Mike diet and compared it against the standard chow, 3X higher soluble fiber. And the mice ate the same amount of food and uh, uh, energy density was the same across groups, but the Mike diet got leaner, lost a ton of fat, and improve body composition. So this goes to the like the what you were saying about if you're eating more plants, um, you know it's going to be easier to you know maintain a lower BMI. Even in old mice, that seems to be the case. Carbohydrate intake you've adjusted as well, and uh, you know at least in epidemiological studies, like moderate carb intake, something like forty to fifty percent is usually the link the lowest mortality. Uh, too high carbohydrate intake is can obviously have some, let's say, implications with health that you can expect related to like blood sugar management and things like that. And in the lower carb intake is usually like either reverse causation or something else that, um, you know, gives that result. So what do you, what, what is, what is your like philosophy with carbohydrate intake? Like how do you adjust it? Yeah. So actually I started on this journey and even growing up as a teenager, uh, on a very high carb diet because 40 ish years ago, uh, that was the prevailing view. Eat very low fat, even, even like bodybuilder magazines were promoting this thing, like, uh, 10% of your calories from fat and then everything else, protein, high protein, and then lots of carbs. So I did that for a very long time and probably at the detriment to some things like lipoprotein A, which, uh, it's related to, you know, cardiovascular disease risk. So mm. mine has always been towards the higher end of the reference range. In tracking that over time, I've seen that on very high carb diets, it's even higher relative to higher fat diets. So, um, my current, um, you know, carb intake of around 40% is based on just following the biomarkers or net carbs that doesn't include fiber. Um, and, and that's a part of, you know, like I said, the net biomarkers more in the right direction than wrong and helping to even control like protein A. Gotcha. Uh, LPA, that's a lot like genetically determined. So how, how much did your diet affect it? Like I would imagine it's not a lot you can affect it with diet. Yeah. So that, that, uh, it's genetically determined and not malleable to any intervention. That's been the prevailing view, published view for a long time. But, you know, remember how hard it is for people to adhere to any kind of dietary uh, intervention, right? So even like uh, an intervention that one group would get 30 grams of fiber and the other group ate 20. I mean, is that enough? Is that enough of a difference, right? Like mm -hmm. statistically, you may see differences, in, you know, in terms of uh, a few variables, but all right. So lipoprotein A for me has been about as twice as high as where it is now. Uh, and that's exclusively by diet. Um, mm. I've tried high dose niacin up to three grams per day, which has been shown to bring it down in the past. I've tried all kinds of things like the high vitamin C, high lysine, like the Linus Pauling stuff. None of that stuff that's been published to make a dent had worked. From In my case, higher fat diets, the higher I go at my highest fat intakes, lipoprotein A has been at its lowest. But there too is that U-shaped curve. If I'm improving lipoprotein A, but glucose is getting worse and uh, a lot of other biomarkers are getting worse at neutrophils, monocytes, markers of inflammation. Right. <laughs> so, so it's finding the bottom of that U shape where I'm not messing up the rest of this stuff too. Mm. Yeah. Like finding a compromise or yeah, like a good balance, but it's, it's malleable, you know, and that's a big 50% reduction at, you know, um, that's a big cut, you know, and mm. I think any, any biomarker is malleable. It's just, 
you know, generating enough data and doing enough, inter- following the data, doing enough interventions, and eventually you get to the truth. We'd all love to get to the truth. You do three blood tests and you fix the problem right away. But unfortunately, just some biomarkers, it, it takes a lot of data generation to, to get there. And lipoprotein A has been one of those. Mm. That's very interesting because, uh, so my own lipoprotein A, the recent test was like three, which is, uh, you know, <laughs> it's super low, like compared to, I don't know what yours was, but, you know, a lot of people might have anything even up to like 50 or 100 or 300, uh, usually with genetics, but mine was three, which is, you know, <laughs> very close to zero. And uh, my diet is like the lowest fat it's ever been uh ever like i actually eat like more carbohydrates and less fat uh than ever before i'm i'm getting maybe like you know 20 20 25 fat and uh mostly from like a little bit of olive oil and mostly from fish is more like most of the fat comes from and dairy some of the dairy and uh, my lp is still like super like uh, close to zero maybe it's so- like genetics hundred percent. That's what I was going to say. Likely genetics. My, uh, you know, cardiovascular disease runs in my family. That's probably what wiped everybody out. Um, and just, just genetically I'll have higher, even at my lowest it, well, at my highest, it's been like 60 something mm. at my lowest now, it, you know, uh, mid thirties, you know, so, which still is, is not terrible, but it's not, you know, almost zero like yours. But the good news is my ApoB, even with that relatively high, uh, lipoprotein A is, relatively low and low risk mm. in terms of all-cause mortality. Yeah, and it just goes to show that you need to test. <laughs> There's so much individual variance. Like for you, a lower carb and a slightly higher fat intake, lower your L- LPA, whereas for me, my LPA is very low uh, with a low fat and a higher carb <laughs> intake, yeah. which is kind of funny. And I don't presume to say, you know, eat my way and you'll have the best health. I, I don't presume that at all. And I, you know, just not to throw a shot, but I know Brian is selling his his blueprint diet to people. And I think part of what made blueprint great in the beginning was, you know, he pitched it as this diet gives me my best biomarker profile. What's yours? You know, and now it's morphed in some way into um, you know, this diet is best for me and it'll be best for you too, right? So mm. it, it individual tracking is going to be the best thing to determine which diet is best, you know? So, and I don't presume it to be my way for some people. It is, uh, for some people eating a different way is best, but like you said, test, test and track and what gets you to your best profile. What's your user's manual for you? Um, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's very true. And, uh, carbohydrates and what, what do you, so like you eat a lot of fiber. So like, what's the (laughs) rationale for that? Yeah. So uh, I think the gut, optimizing the gut is probably the most underrated approach for potentially impacting longevity that exists. Mm. Uh, And then I can hear the protein crowd saying, again, protein is the most, you know, muscle is the, is the longevity organ. We need to eat lots of protein. It's not fiber. I'm not, I'm not trying to say fiber is better than protein. I'm just trying to say that fiber is underrated. And then there'll be the other side of the coin where people say, you know, the carnivore crowd will say, you don't need fiber at all. Beta hydroxybutyrate is increased on a ketosis. I don't know how they compare. Like you could eat nothing but butter. I don't know how much butyrate you would get and hope that your body converts it into beta hydroxybutyrate. Is that going to be as much as my gut bacteria converting fiber into butyrate? I don't know what the answer is. There's probably, you know, inter-individual variability too. And I don't, I don't know about optimizing intestinal barrier function with beta hydroxybutyrate versus butyrate. Sure. They're structurally similar. One just has an OH group, hydroxyl group relative to butyrate. But I, I looked, I haven't seen studies that have looked at gut barrier function with beta hydroxybutyrate versus acetate, propionate, and butyrate, the standard short chain fatty acids. So hmm. fiber story is essentially, I'm trying to optimize my uh, you know, bacteria that produce short chain fatty acids because that's been shown to optimize gut barrier function, which should lead to less inflammation uh, and you know all the things associated with it systemically. So um, yeah. Is it 50 grams the optimal? Is it 80 grams is the optimal? I, I don't know what the optimal number is, but I'm mm. a volume eater too. So the fiber helps with uh, satiety. Um, if I'm not eating a very high fiber diet, it's just hard for me to be satisfied. And the drive to overeat will be more, which would potentially ruin everything, you know, cal- just right. too many calories being bad. Yeah. Yeah. Like I haven't like specifically weighed my fiber or counted my fiber but i would imagine yeah it's, it's at least 30 grams maybe 40 
I, I don't think it's like 50 or 60, but maybe 40. But yeah, like, you know, if you eat a lot of fiber, then you're, you know, what kind of foods have fiber? They're mostly like these lower calorie vegetables and plants and fruits and uh, stuff like that. So you're like, it's much yeah, easier to adhere to a calorie deficit in that scenario or to a achieve a calorie deficit in the first place versus, you know, consuming a lot of these higher calorie meals and, you know, processed foods, they don't have that much fiber at all. So yeah, like it's a very kind of hu good heuristic as well for the average person who isn't like fully into tracking and weighing or their food, like what, what is a good way for them to improve their health and biomarkers? It's generally going to be like, you know, weight loss and the way you achieve, achieve weight loss is with a, a higher fiber and maybe like a slightly higher protein uh, intake as well. Uh, that's generally true, but I should say I, I have at least one client where the higher fiber approach and not 80 grams, but just around 40 grams, 30 to 40 grams, it, they're not satisfied on it and it mm. doesn't help them get leaner. Whereas flipping it the other way and eating almost no fiber helps them be more satiated and helps them lose more weight. But there's still like that titration process where I'm working with them to try to get, you know, at least supplemental fiber in there, knowing it can improve the other biomarkers that may not be, you know, optimizing in, in conjunction with the weight loss. So mm. it doesn't have to be always high fiber. You know, it's, it's what diet mm -hmm. helps you get your leanest. And then is that optimal for all your biomarkers? And if it's not, even, even, even Paul Saladino, who is pure carnivore has modified his approach. And I think, so I made a video, you know, uh, on Paul's biological age, when he went on Joe Rogan's podcast, he, he showed all his blood test data back then. This was like three, four years ago. And I mean, his pheno age was like three years younger than his chronological, which is insanity. He's lean, you know, he's fit. There's no reason it should be, you know, that small of a deficit. So since then, he's added a whole bunch of stuff here and there. And even uh, Sean Baker, I don't know how I keep talking about carnivore, but mm -hmm. Sean Baker said he started eating apples. You know, um, I don't know if that was because of uh, the uh, lean mass hyperresponder stuff and he wants to minimize heart, heart disease risk. I'm yeah. not sure what the answer is. But he, he, he mentioned he was looking at glucose levels, you know, so mm. it, it goes back to that idea of whatever diet you're on, just in addition to leanness, just test so that you, you know, is that truly best for your biomarkers? And if it's not, what can you add? What tweaks, tweaks can you make mm. to have the net on net effect on your biomarkers be, you know, as youthful and quote unquote, as optimal in terms of all cause mortality risk as possible. Yeah. It's like, you gotta have like open mind as well as like, uh, like a kind of agnostic approach to diet and uh, things because yeah if you already have a set belief in your head that hey this diet is the best without even actually like <laughs> having measured your biomarkers then you're just yeah like relying on illusions or you're just having a fantasy in your head that you're like kind of playing some sort of other game that's not related to optimizing longevity and health like you're playing a game of belief systems <laughs> But with one exception, if, if the idea is eat real food and exercise on any diet approach and cut out as much as you can process foods, I mean, that's probably going to be good for health. But then as you mentioned, subdividing that diet space into ideologies, like, yeah, like you said, mm. yeah, sure. need data. Yeah, you, you always have to yeah, have an open approach to these things. Like I've changed my diet, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to have to change it in some way as well in the future. So it's like, I'm, I'm never like, okay, I'm just stuck in my ways and I'm going to do it <laughs> like that. Yeah. Oh, and for people, there are probably people who do that. And then maybe they cherry pick and they say, look at my metabolic health. Yeah. But what about, and I've done this where people say, you know, and I don't, I, I try to stay away from these quote unquote conversations, arguments now, because how do you argue with someone, like you said, who doesn't have an open mind? You know, they'll say, look at my metabolic health. And I'm like, okay, what about the other markers? And then all of a sudden I'm <laughs> hear from them again, right? So yeah, um, it's like yeah. you have you have one, your diabetes risk is low based on your blood sugar or triglycerides, but uh, diabetes is only the seventh leading cause of death. So it's, it's not like even in the top five. So there's, you know, dozens of other biomarkers that also matter and uh, actually affect the risk. Definitely, definitely, yeah. But like you said, in terms of being malleable with the approach, you know, it, sometimes it's not easy, you know, and even having an open mind, like for example, to get eggs into my, or back into my diet, to get that one egg per day, uh, back into the diet, I had to get 80 calories from somewhere. Right. So, mm. uh, dates, uh, I include dates every day. Just, I eat flaxseed, flaxseed has a net positive score, a correlative score in my data. So, but it's ground and on its own, I can do flaxseed like that, like maybe a couple days a week, 
but you know, to consistently do it forever, it's like, you know, in some ways I'm eating sawdust, you know, it's just like wood dust in a way. Right. But adding dates now it's very, you know, it's good. Right. So I, I'm not happy to take out the dates, but I want to do this experiment with eggs back in the approach. So the calories had to come from somewhere. So I had to take dates, you know, out more days than not during the week. So, um, yeah, being married to any dietary ideology, probably not the best way to optimize biomarkers. Yeah. Where does, so your fiber is like 70 to 80 grams. What kind of foods, where do you uh, get, get them from? Or do you take any supplement, fiber supplement? Yeah, no fiber supplements. It's actually 80 to 90 grams now. Uh, average is about 85. Um, the majority is uh, green leafy vegetables. So uh, 420 grams of collard greens per day, uh, 330 grams of uh, beets per day, about 300 grams of carrots per day. So I've got a mix of starchy and non-starchy uh, vegetables there. So those three alone, it's a big chunk of where the fiber uh, comes from. But then also, you know, nuts, flaxseed. I mean, I I'm averaging like 25 grams of flaxseed per day. That's a big fiber shot. Um, what else is on my list? Broccoli's in there. The chickpeas are in there. So it, it, it all adds up. But the majority are probably from those, uh, and actually red bell peppers. So it's, uh, you know, collard greens, carrots, red bell peppers, and um, beets are probably the four main ones where I'm getting a big, you know, 40 to 50 grams just from that. Gotcha. And what about the fats then? Like, uh, what was it, like 45% fat? Yeah, that includes fiber though, you know, because fiber being, so it's probably about 36, ah, okay. 37 without the fiber being fermented into a short chain. So the fat is almost exclusively from, uh, uh, besides sardines, which have about 20 grams, uh, almonds, walnuts, peanuts, flaxseed, um, Brazil nuts, pistachios, right? So I've got a mix of all of those, but even, even how much of those that I'm aiming for, it's, uh, you know, I've got targets for omega-3, I've got targets for omega-6, I've even got targets for uh, saturated fat, which I use coconut butter and cacao beans. Um, so I've got targets for all of that based on the biomarkers that, you know, for some things like omega-6, and, and this isn't from seed oils, even in my case, too many walnuts higher omega-6, that's correlated with my liver enzymes looking like I've got, you know, I'm like I'm an alcoholic for, for whatever reason. I don't know what the mechanism is. ALT, AST move closer to 40 with, with a higher omega-3 intakes correlated. But when I cut my omega-6 back down to about 16 grams per day or less, liver enzymes are about half that. So, um, so I have specific target with the sum of those nuts too, where I have to be careful. Gotcha. And uh, how much do you like, do you, how much do you know how much the fiber ferments into the fat? So it's about 20 ish percent. So of total fiber, that's the estimate. Okay. Uh, so for 85 grams of total fiber, about 20% or so of that would be expected to come from soluble fiber. Uh, so then it's, it's about 9%, um, from fiber, soluble fiber, that's potentially converted into the short chain fatty acids that, that assumes that I have those bacteria that could ferment uh, fiber into short chain fatty acids, which may not be totally the case. Um, some things like the phytobacteria in my gut microbiome are completely absent. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it would be generally about 20%. Gotcha. Is there a way for people to like, you know, obviously like it's hard to like put into a calculator all your biomarkers and then the data says like <laughs> this is your life expectancy or something like that but um you know if someone people do these tests and stuff like that how can they know how good are they doing like if they have let's say a particular set of lipid markers and inflammation and blood cell markers and stuff like that uh, how do they know if it's good how do they know if it's younger than their chronological age how do they know that it's actually bad and you know they're heading in the wrong direction yeah. So I wouldn't focus on the reference range to get that information because mm. it can be within range and your data changing, either increasing or decreasing and completely miss an age-related change. The easy answer is I have plans to put this into a book. Uh, I've covered a lot of what's optimal in terms of these biomarkers, in terms of how they change during aging and uh, all-cause mortality risk in as large of the epidemiological studies as possible. For example, I don't want to look at a study of you know, a thousand people. But if there's only one study on a thousand people for something like RDW and age-related changes, then the data is what it is. But for example, like albumin, looking at studies of, of a million people or more 
And how does that change during aging? And then what's the all-cause mortality risk? So from that, I can make a prediction of what would be quote unquote optimal, right? Do you want your albumin to be high? Do you want it to be low? How does it change during aging? And then trying to resist that. So a lot of those data are on the YouTube channel. You just search, you know, uh, you know, by keyword for the biomarker, but for the ones that aren't, um, I plan on putting all that in a, in a, in a book. Um, and then even without that, just using some of these calculators like, uh, Levine's Phenoage, um, which integrates nine of those biomarkers, um, just having a younger biological age relative to your chronological is associated with lower risk of all-cause mortality. Uh, and then there's something like for every one-year increase in phenoage, all-cause mortality risk increased by 9%. So even without the specific data on biomarkers, just using simple tools like that has to be better than just doing nothing and, and guessing. Right. Do you think these, you know, the phenoage, for example, is it, is it a good like a uh, umbrella clock or, or, or like an umbrella marker. And what I mean is like, if your phenol age is good, does it mean that your other like, you know, markers are also predicted to be good or what, how does it correlate? Yeah. So it, it, the, there's a couple ways to look at it. One is, is it strongly correlated with chronological age? And it is. So in two separate studies, 0 0.96, 0 0.98, as close to one in that case would be perfectly linear. So it's as good as the best epigenetic clock, Horvath, for its correlation with chronological age. Now, part of that story is a bit confounded because it has age in a model predicting chronological age. So even if you throw right. that data away, it's associated with all-cause mortality risk, right? And as I mentioned, you know, if you have an older age relative to chronological, it's associated with an increased risk. So, um, so even taking that out, right? And you know, some people just don't like the QC. Uh, biological age tests, right? Like if you say, oh, I'm X years younger, right? If, okay, even if we throw that away and it's irrelevant, right? Which I don't believe uh, based on all-cause mortality data. The biomarkers are inc it includes are representative of major organ systems. You've got glucose, you've got creatinine, kidney function, you've got ALP and albumin, liver function, you've got total white blood cells, which isn't perfect. I'd like to see neutrophils and lymphocytes separately, but White blood cells, you've got immune, immune, you know, immune cells there. It's got the RDW, red blood cell related marker. Uh, so it's got biomarkers representative of many organ systems. So, um, yeah, I think it's in, you know, and, and it's free too, you know, you know, as probably the, the, I don't, I don't want to say, you know, use a free clock, you get what you use. Right. But, um, mm -hmm. it's a good clock and knowing that it's free, um, you know, can't, can't, can't lose. Mm. Yeah. I think there are like some websites that, or how do, are there some websites that where you can put the 13 markers and and then it's going to do the phenoage? Yeah, the problem there is though. So when phenoage was first published, they had an error in the in their algorithm and they published a correction uh that a lot of those uh email-based websites don't have the corrected uh mm. phenoage algorithm. And it was a simple fix. It wasn't anything crazy, but it's like fixing one number in the algorithm, which if you had the manual download spreadsheet, and I don't, I don't want to say I have people, I have a link on my website, which has the corrected version of PhenoAge, and they can just download it as, a, as an Excel file. And they don't have to go and enter your email and get all the spam, you know, that goes with that. Gotcha. Right. And uh, what, what, what were the 30 markers that, or what do you think is the best one then? Um, Best of the clocks to you kind of use. So I I don't know best, but phenoage is is pretty good. Uh, there are other clocks that you know you can put in like steps per day, glucose, blood pressure, that'll give you an output. Um, that's not bad, but it's just got a few markers. Um, and I, if I remember correct, so it's I, I think it's called Anthropo Age. Uh, so that one's free too, um, and pretty easy to use. There's another one that's based on. Um, like body body size measurements, so like arm circumference, thigh circumference, I think waist circumference, and and uh, and body weight, and that gives you an output biological age. And again, these are trained, you know, um, in in you know published studies. These aren't just you know random questionnaires that you know th that's how it used to be. So, in terms of the blood biomarker, I'd say that phenoage is pretty good um, on its own. Um, as a low-hanging fruit without having to look at, okay, I have 30 biomarkers, 25 biomarkers, what's all-cause mortality risk for all of them? It's mm -hmm. phenoate is easy to use. It's just a simple tool for that. Yeah, and what were the tests, the, the markers there? Uh, so al albumin, 
uh, creatinine, CRP, glucose, alkaline phosphatase, white blood cells, uh, RDW, MCV. I'm missing one. CRP? I don't know if I said CRP, but there are nine. There are nine that you answered. Okay. Age. The <laughs> and chronological age, yeah. Yep. And, and even there, so um, in NHANES, one of the studies that it was used to uh, um, you know, derive that, that model, I think the average phenoage age um, for a, a study of about 10 or 11,000 people was five years younger than their chronological. So if your phenoage age is five years younger, basically average, that's an average biological age. The question is though, the maximum reduction using that, that test is about 20 years younger relative to your chronological. Mm. So sure, having, you know, minus 12, minus nine, that's, that's good. It's better than average, but can you improve it to minus 20? And then not just that, can you maintain that every year, mm. right? The challenge there is even if your biomarkers stay the same, those nine biomarkers stay the same, uh, biological age increases by 0.9 years per chronological year using that clock. So you've got to actually make sure your data is getting better over to time. <laughs> yeah. But even then, it, even if you've got 20 year old biomarkers, you know, there's probably some error in that clock where, you know, like we were saying earlier, if, if you're 80 and you have those biomarkers literally look like a 20 year old, it'll say you're 60. But are you really 60 if your biomarkers in that clock on that clock are, are what you'd find in a 20 year old? Probably not 60 and you're probably not 20, you know, somewhere in the middle there. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. For sure. <laughs> there's even then it's yeah, like your biomarkers might be good, but your like physical function might be worse. So yeah. Although, you know, if you have good biomarkers, then you probably have like some good aspect of physical function and, you know, cognitive function as well. But it, to cover that base, like I was saying, if there are blind spots to phenoage, like blood pressure is not included, lung function is not included. Mm. Sure, you've got liver, kidney, immune, inflammation, metabolic status, right? It's got a lot, but I want to cover as many of the organ systems as possible, easily measured organ systems as possible. So three days a week, I'm looking at FEV1. I'm, you know, blowing hard, you know, into the spirometer and and putting on the cuff, you know, for uh, six measurements within a 30 minute, 15 minute span, just to make sure those things aren't getting worse, you know, over time too. Mm. And you're measuring it like every day or? Three days a week. I, I mm. could get carried away, but, you know, it, three days a week, I think, you know, it, it becomes a, me a measure of how many days a week do you need to track some of these things to have, you know, an accurate representation of where your data really is, right? It's like mm. for the people who blood test once a year, is one blood test representative of a full year's worth of data? You know, what's the variability every couple of months? Mm. Uh, how often, or what are the things that you do then every day, like your resting heart rate, sleep? steps or calories or it not i don't track steps but i track the average daily heart rate which is probably a better measure relative to steps is you know if you walk a thousand steps on a flat uh plane versus a thousand step up up a hill it's still a thousand steps but one of those right. is going to be a higher heart rate yeah so hmm. resting heart rate heart rate variability um average daily heart rate total sleep sleep stages um everything in the diet everything is weighed um Room, nighttime room temperature, body weight. Mm, gotcha. <laughs> Sounds good. And then you do like a, every, how often do you do blood test then? Like how every, every few months? Seven times, seven times a year is my, uh, actually I did it eight times last year. But when I do the blood testing, it's, it's the standard chemistry, uh, you know, complete metabolic panel, those basics, CRP, that's seven, at least seven times per year. And then mm. on the same day as those tests, I've added in the epigenetics, metabolomics, NAD, um, but then sporadically throughout the year, I'm still working on optimizing things in my oral microbiome. Uh, so at least for those foundational tests right now, it's seven times per year. If I have a specific test uh, or intervention that I want to do, sometimes I'll move it up. Like some of the NAD tests, I think I tested 15 times last year in a 12 month span, but I'm trying different inter interventions outside of you know, big picture, which is, uh, you know, the seven blood tests per year. Mm, gotcha. I work with a client who tests 12 times per year. So pe there are people more crazy than me with this stuff. Nice. Um, yeah, well, it's been really awesome talking with you again and going into all the details. Uh, you know, at least I love it. <laughs> and I'm, I hope that people who watch it uh, also like it. But uh, where can people learn, you know, more about your stuff? And how can they like, 
try to if they want to implement something like the, what you're doing in terms of what blood tests to do and how do they like you know actually know their biomarkers and health where can people learn that info yeah so the youtube channel is conquer aging or die trying actually at all of my social uh media stuff is conquer aging or die trying for any information on biomarkers just you know they'd come go there and do a search or hit me up in the comments or send me an email or tweet you know tweet at me or message you know, i'm i try to be very av available to try to help as many people as i can you know on the journey on 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 a similar journey so but how about the ldl the need and pace uh correlation you want to see that or we save that for another time uh yeah i mean we we can yeah for sure add it in like we i don't like people don't know the backstory but <laughs> ah. you can you can you can talk about it or you can make an introduction about it all right, so the goal is to have an epigenetic pace of aging, Dunedin pace value that's as slow as possible, 0 0.6, right? So the first thing is it's harder to maintain a youthful Dunedin pace as you get older because that increases during aging too. So my data has been an average around 0 0.81, which is better than expected based on chronological age, but it's not as young as guys like you, Joe Cohen, people who are 10 to 15 years younger, you know, uh, 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 chronologically, right? So so how can I get and now granted Brian Johnson's now I guess he's reached you know where you guys are and he's a bit older chronologically. So but he's throwing 100 different supplements like kitchen sink. He's hitting it with everything, right? I'm not doing that. I try the opposite approach, right? How can I change my diet and overall strategy? So the first thing I look at is correlations with diet. You know, as I mentioned, I track diet every day, every blood test is a corresponding diet intake. So I have 13 tests for Dunedin Pace, and I've looked at correlations. And unfortunately, nothing meets the significance threshold with a, a p-value less than 0 0.05, which is just the basic th threshold. It's nothing crazy. So it seems like I'm out of luck. How am I going to improve Dunedin Pace if nothing is significant? So then I did a biomarker versus biomarker analysis, meaning on the same day as those 13 tests, I also sent you know blood for analysis for all of the other stuff that I do. So how does that correlate in is there a story there? So when I do that, and I'll, I'll sh you know share screen. Uh, let's see here. So one of the one of the four significant correlations again with that p value less than zero point zero five is LDL, and not the way maybe some people would expect he, with this correlation here. So we've got Dunedin pace value on the y-axis plotted against LDL. These are my thirteen days of data. So here it says significant inverse correlation is what we can see with that correlation coefficient and the p-value at 0 0.05. In other words, the higher my LDL within the 83 to 62 range, 62 to 83, the lower the epigenetic pace of aging, which then goes to the question of, is too low for LDL potentially bad? And I'll get to that in a second, but... It also goes to, I don't want to have an LDL of 190, which has been shown you know, uh, in primary prevention studies even, not just the epidemiological obs observational, to be associated with an increased cardiovascular disease risk. So you know, how high can I go where it's safe, where I keep my uh, CHD risk low, while potentially also slowing my epigenetic pace of aging? So that's one reason why I've added actually eggs back into the diet and increased my saturated fat levels by a bit to try to push my LDL into this zone to test this hypothesis. Uh, mm. And then in terms of how high can I go for LDL, if this is a real association, if it's not just correlation, um, that goes to heart disease risk, right? So this is probably the best data that I've come across for the association for LDL with uh, heart disease mortality risk. And the reason I say that is because a lot of these studies don't account for reverse causation by adjusting their model for literally every uh, disease that can affect this association. So for example, in the minimally adjusted model, um, you know, age, sex, uh, age, sex, race, and smoking status, you can see how the curve looks for an LDL of 120. It, it would be associated with a 20% lower risk of heart disease mortality. But in the second model, when adjusting for more factors, including statin use, BMI, hypertension, diabetes, now you can see that that risk is only 10%. So those variables can impact the association for LDL with heart disease mortality risk. But when you further adjust for literally almost every um, you know, reverse causation related disease, including heart disease, AFib, heart failure, I mean, these are the standards, but where it goes above and beyond is 
liver disease, kidney disease, lung disease, cancer, depression, and dementia. Most of the LDL-based studies and looking at heart disease risk don't adjust for the all of mm. these, only some. And when you include those co uh, uh, covariates, now you can see that 120 is not associated with, a, with an in increased heart disease mortality risk, whereas levels higher than that are. Okay. Mm. So now we're talking about what's the lower limit. And you can see that, you know, so the shaded uh, green region is above one, which suggests that anything lower than 65 could be associated with increased heart disease risk. Now, to take it back to, to where my data is, if you notice, my worst epigenetic pace of aging is, granted, it's two data points at that level, but one of them is my worst data ever, and the other is, you know, not great either. So this is just another way of showing that, you know, we can use uh, multiple biomarkers to try to get at what is the optimal LDL outside mm. of what the published data shows. Yes, I mean, even then, like, you know, 65 is like astronomically low for most people and uh, even 85 is lower than like you know 90 percent of people so even then you're still like in the 99 percentile of people with the lowest uh, ldl if that makes sense so uh yeah like you have a lot of room to kind of experiment and see how it affects the the results so to say and you know and maybe like the maybe like the color intake or whatever, like some other things can also like affect that. Uh, so it's, yeah, interesting. And of course, you know, which one would you think is more important uh, in terms of the evidence, like the dunedin pace or the other like cardiovascular disease markers? So to say, like you have to kind of yeah, think about which ones, which one have more data and which one are like more important to kind of focus on for whatever person. But they could both be important though in separate mechanisms, right? And, mm. and you know, so this is just correlation for now, right? It, if I push my LDL to 100, 95, 110, and I start to see Dunedin pace come down to 0 0.7, 0 0.6, you know, knowing that that LDL range was 65 to 120, I can still technically stay safe within that, you know, heart disease mortality risk range while also keeping my Dunedin pace, you know, my epigenetic pace of aging uh, as low as physically possible. Mm. So, yeah, um, for sure. but imagine if I didn't look at, look at it, look, look at that. Right. And, you know, I went by this idea of lower is always better for LDL, which is, there is some prevailing view. I mean, a lot of lipidologists, you know, that that's what they'll, if you have heart disease, I buy that a hundred percent. I don't, as far as I know right now, I don't have heart disease. Right. So, uh, but yeah, it just goes to that idea of, you know, how can I optimize multiple biomarkers by, you know, looking at them all as opposed to only focusing on it isolation, um, and then missing potentially a big, you know, part of the story, epigenetic pace of aging. Yeah. Well, this is a good <laughs> little uh, bonus in the end. But uh, yeah, uh, conquer aging or die trying on YouTube, and people can check it out. I'll put the link in the description as well. And yeah, it's been great talking with you. We can certainly, or we will probably do like more episodes in the future once your data changes or once your approach uh, changes as well. Cool. Thanks, Sim. All right, I'll see you around. Other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure you click a like and subscribe. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.